Good morning, everyone. Thank you for uh, coming today. My name is Lorenzo Fertitta. I'm the UFC's chairman and CEO. To my left is Lawrence Ike Epstein, who is our chief operating officer. And to my right, of course, is Dana White, our president. First, I want to share with you today how our uh, press conference and statements are going to work and why we've called this press conference. <clears throat> First, I'm going to uh, read prepared remarks that will address <clears throat> what we've done in the past related to drug testing and how we've, both advoc how we've advoc advocated for both in and out of competition testing over the last few years. Dana will then take a few minutes to clarify some recent issues relating to um, some specific drug tests and UFC athletes. We will then review statistics that show our recent history of in and out of competition testing for the period of 2013 and 2014. Next, we're going to lay out our strategy for moving forward and addressing these issues. We will then open it up to the floor and to the phone lines for questions. <clears throat> As you know, it's been a challenging few weeks here at the UFC. While our popularity worldwide continues to grow, we have recently seen issues with several of our high-profile athletes failing drug tests. We're extremely disappointed in these failed drug tests, but truthfully, they are a result of our commitment to enhanced drug testing. We said that we were going to catch athletes using PEDs through these testing procedures, and we are doing just that. These findings have caused us to take a deeper look at our current policies, our administration and communication process, as well as how we can continue to better educate and lead our athletes in the areas of health and wellness. We've always deemed it our responsibility to take the leadership position on key areas impacting our sport, and fighter health and safety has always been at the top of our list. When we purchased this company in 2001, only one state regulated the sport of mixed martial arts. Today, the sport is regulated throughout the U.S. and by international regulatory bodies around the world. This is a direct result of our efforts. We spent countless hours going from state capitol building to state capitol building, international city to international city, pushing for the sport to be properly regulated. By doing so, we have built the foundation for the regulation of mixed martial arts. As I mentioned, our priority has always been the health and safety of our athletes. Our track record reflects this. In recent years, we partnered with and funded organizations such as the Cleveland Clinic to better understand health and safety issues related to the brain. We've held fighter summits to educate our athletes on a variety of topics, including the dangers of PED usage. In addition, we are the first and only combat sports promoter in history to offer unprecedented, customized accident insurance coverage for all of our athletes on the roster. Lastly, we have firmly advocated, advocated for and supported drug testing initiatives led by athletic commissions and international federations. On February 27, 2014, the day the Nevada State Athletic Commission terminated therapeutic use exemptions for testosterone replacement therapy, Dana perhaps stated our commitment best when he said, we believe our athletes should compete based on their natural abilities and on an even playing field. Furthermore, in 2013 and 2014, we committed additional resources to identify athletes using performance-enhancing drugs through our increased testing efforts with athletic commissions and international regulatory bodies. Today, nearly two years later, we are committed more than ever to leading the commissions worldwide and taking out the use of PEDs from our sport to protect the safety of the athletes and the integrity of the sport. In recent years, we made it a point to run towards regulation. Now, we're making it a point to run towards fixing this PED issue head on. Through our work with athletic commissions and regulatory bodies, via both in and out of competition testing, these tests have uncovered UFC athletes using banned substances and performance enhancing drugs. Our current methods are catching athletes using PEDs. Although we feel confident that the in-competition testing has been effective, we recognize the need for a more robust out-of-competition plan in accordance with athletic commissions and regulatory bodies. Simply put, we can do better. 
We've all seen similar challenges in the world of sports. And consequently, we see that the UFC is no more immune to performance-enhancing drug use than any other major sport. We can take the learning from actions taken and continue to work diligently to protect the health and safety of UFC athletes and the integrity of the sport. Today marks the continuation of our call to action to combat the use of PEDs. It's our belief that this plan will drive us to making our sport safer and allowing all of our athletes to compete on an even playing field. By doing so, we will not only be a leader in mixed martial arts, but also in the world of professional sports. This time, I'm gonna turn it over to Dana and ask him to clarify some issues related to recent drug test failures for some of our high profile athletes. Good morning, everybody. So most of the media understands how this works, but there's a lot of myths and misconceptions out there about the last few uh, positive tests that have happened here in the UFC. So I want to clarify a few things. I'll start with John Jones. John Jones was tested out of competition on December 4th. When he was tested, he tested positive for cocaine. He was then again tested on December 18th. He was negative for PEDs. He was not tested again for cocaine. For people who don't understand the way that WADA works, the WADA rules and regulations, you do not test for recreational drugs out of competition. Okay? Out of competition, you do not test for recreational drugs. So then he was tested again on January 3rd post-fight. After the fight, he was tested, and he tested negative for everything. Performance-enhancing drugs or recreational drugs, okay? Um, so the difference between out of competition testing for PEDs. So people, I saw a lot of people talking about, John Jones tested positive for cocaine, yet you see other fighters getting in big trouble for testing positive for marijuana. That is the difference between out of competition and in competition. John Jones tested positive for cocaine out of competition. In competition, he's tested negative. So these fighters that you hear about, they get in big trouble for uh, marijuana or any other recreational drug, it's during competition. So had John Jones tested positive for a recreational drug after the fight, he would be even in more trouble, okay? He was fined $25,000 for violating the code of conduct, and that money ended up being donated to a uh, charity that benefits children impacted by drug use, all right? And at the end, there'll be a Q&A here so we can get more into all this stuff, but I just want to set the record straight on a few things. The next one is Anderson Silva. <clears throat> so Anderson Silva had a pre-fight test, an out-of-competition test, okay? Um, and that test was on January 9th, and it was done by the Sports Medicine and Research Testing Laboratory, which is a world anti-doping agency and accredited lab in Salt Lake City, Utah. That test was taken on January 9th, right? The Nevada State Athletic Commission did not get that test result back until Tuesday, February 23rd, and we found out, February 3rd, I'm sorry, Tuesday, February 3rd. They got the test back Tuesday, February 3rd, which was after the event. We found out at 10 a.m. that morning. The Nevada State Athletic Commission notified us, and we found out that morning. So we're going to hand out this drug test to, to the media here. We actually have the test. I want everybody to see it. Some of you I know already know the answers to this and already get it, but i gotta, I got to walk through this for the people that do not. Fans, too. There's fans and everybody. And let me, let me start by saying this. Believe me, if you don't think when this pre-fight test came into us on Tuesday, we didn't say, how is this just coming in now? This doesn't make sense. So if you look at the test, right, it's up on the screen still. Right up in the right-hand corner, it says collection date. The collection date was 1-9-2015. The lab receipt date, the day they received it, was 1-12-2015, and the report date was 2-3-2015, all right? That test did not come back until after the fight, and that's when we were notified. First of all, the Nevada Athletic Commission would never let a fighter go in if they knew he was on performance-enhancing drugs, and we would never do that. 
No fight or no one fighter is worth the integrity of this sport. It would never happen. This test came back after the fact. There's some issues there. I get it. And, and, and uh, you know, these are all things that are being worked on now. Um, but I just want everybody to know we would never do that. The Nevada State Athletic Commission would never do that. And, and the test is right here. And for those of you that didn't see it, Kevin Ioli actually called this lab and, 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 and did an interview with the, with the doctor who does this testing, and he explained to him and broke it down what happened and why that test was late. Um, also, Anderson Silva tested positive in his post-fight PED drug test. He will now go before the Nevada State Athletic Commission to plead his case. Hector Lombard. Hector Lombard failed his post-fight test on January 3rd. The results came back on January 13th. So as soon as we heard that he tested positive, we yanked him off the card. He was supposed to fight in Montreal in the co-main event against Rory McDonald. So as soon as we heard he was out, <laughs> out of the fight, and uh, so people started saying to us, well, why didn't you release Why didn't you announce that Hector Lombard tested positive. We never announce when a guy tests positive unless we're self-regulating. If we self-regulate an event and we get the test back and somebody is positive, we let the media know, we let the fighter know, and then we, we lay down our sentence. But there's never a situation where we announce a, a, a drug test that was done by the Nevada State Athletic Commission. They do it. So we responded quickly, we yanked them out of the fight, and now Rory McDonald will fight Robbie Lawler for the UFC Welterweight Championship on July 11th at the MGM Grand in Las Vegas. We can talk about this in the Q&A. That's all I got. So moving on, one of the things that we'd like to move on to next is talk about uh, the raw data that we have assembled um, given the years 2013 and 2014. And um, the, the statistics and the numbers are on this slide. Um, bear with me, I'm going to walk through it. It's obviously apparent in the slide, but I'm still going to walk through it. <clears throat> During that time period, <clears throat> the UFC hosted 79 events. During those 79 events, approximately 900 in-competition tests were administered out of the 1,800 occasions that UFC fighters entered the octagon. The reason for that, obviously, is that Fighters fought multiple times um, during the year, and that's why there's uh, 1,800 occasions. So it's approximately half of the uh, fighters. I will note that when we self-regulate, we have adopted the policy over the past couple of years that we, um, in competition, test 100% of the fighters. Out of the approximate 900 in competition tests, 10 fighters have tested positive for recreational drugs, representing 1.1% and 12 fighters have tested positive for PEDs, representing 1.3%. In addition to in-competition testing, over the last couple of years, there has been an a, uh, adoption of out-of-competition testing. Given the data that we are, have been able to compile, we know we've been able to verify that there have been 19 occasions where fighters were subjected to out-of-competition PED tests. We also know that there have been five uh, fighters that have tested positive, representing 26.3%. Now, we believe that there has been more occasions. I will note that when athletic commissions or federations do out of competition testing, they don't necessarily inform us, certainly don't inform us when they're doing it. Um, we believe that there has been more occasions, but as of today, we've not been able to verify more than 19. What is readily apparent on that slide, though, is that 26.3% failure rate is an alarming rate to us. But what that means to us is that something needs to be done to increase the amount of out-of-competition testing. What I'm going to lay out for you next is how we are going to address that issue. This is the testing call to action from the UFC. UFC will immediately advocate to all commissions to test every fighter in competition from every card. We want 100% of the fighters tested the night that they compete in competition. If there's additional costs associated with that that's outside of any state or federation's budget, 
we will pay for any additional costs required. That means that in a calendar year, based on 41 events, that we will administer approximately 984 tests annually. Events are more than 12 bytes per card, that number will adjust accordingly. In addition to that, UFC in conjunction with local athletic commissions subject all main event and championship bout fighters to enhanced out of competition PED test testing effective July 1, 2015. Now that certainly doesn't mean that from today up until that point that there will not be out of competition testing. There will be. In order for us to put this structure in place, which we'll explain later, it's going to take us some time to work with third-party uh, collection agencies, third-party testing agencies, get contracts done, get procedures done, and uh, we'll walk in, we'll, we'll address that more later. Given that, we assume that there will be approximately 96 marquee fighters tested on an annual basis, once again. Given the assumption of 41 fight cards, we also assume that of the 13 premier events, or we call them pay-per-view events, that eight of those will have double uh, championship bouts. That's how we get to that number. <clears throat> Next. UFC. The UFC will institute comprehensive out of competition random PET testing for all UFC fighters will be subject to this effective July 1, 2015. That means that approximately 585 fighters on the roster, which fluctuates on a week-to-week -week basis, but approximately at any given time we have 585 fighters, they will be subject by an independent, to testing by an independent third party using WADA testing standards. We are currently and have been and currently engaged in talks with numerous reputable global drug testing organizations to create this random drug testing protocol once again our goal, and, and we are confident that we can have it in place by July 1, 2015. What does this mean from a fiscal standpoint? Years 2013 and 2014, the UFC spent approximately half a million dollars in testing expenses. Given that the number of tests will increase at a minimum tenfold, potentially significantly more, we understand and we are willing to commit several million dollars for both in and out of competition and random PED drug testing. In addition to that, and maybe most importantly in ridding uh, our sport of PED usage, we are advocating for longer suspensions and harsher penalties by state athletic commissions, international federations, or whatever body is handing down um, penalties. Currently, I believe that the water standard is um, on a first-time offender for PED uses, a two-year ban. We certainly advocate for that. We understand that WADA is either contemplating or will institute a uh, first-time first offender, a four-year ban. We, have, we will absolutely support that as well. Um, there has to be harsher penalties to rid the sport um, of PED usage. They're committed to it in every way that you possibly could be. There should be no mistake there. And I think that this definitely should be a, um, a call out to all of our athletes that are on our roster that you will be tested both in competition, you will be tested out of competition, and if you are using performance enhancing drugs, you will be caught and you will be, there will be um, significant penalties that will go along with that. That, um, unless you guys have anything to add, I'm happy to open it up um, for questions, and we're happy to uh, answer whatever whatever you guys have. Thank you, uh, Lorenzo. I had the opportunity to sit with uh, Lawrence and Kirk and Mark a couple of weeks ago and talk about the drug testing issues. And I've been planning to write a story, but we've had you know so many tests that it's. It and to phone participants at a star one to ask a question. Legal situations. Um, so number one, how did this all change in the couple weeks since I spoke to you, Lawrence, to now where the legal situations that were precluding you from you know, enacting USADA testing or any other full-time random testing until now are, are now, you know, now gone and you can act? Well, certainly nothing has changed from that standpoint. 
I will tell you this. This is something that we've been working on for some time. These issues are complex, and we don't have all the answers. Um, we felt like, though, given the recent um, spat of high-profile cases that have come back positive, that um, we needed to address this sooner rather than later. Typically, I don't like to uh, call press conferences until we have 100% concrete signed contracts being done. But we felt that uh, for the good of the sport, the integrity of the sport, the integrity of what we're trying to, to, to do here, that we needed to address these issues at ASAP. I'll let Lawrence speak to some of those issues because they're, they're significant issues. It's not as easy as just saying, hey, let's flip the switch, start testing fighters. Right. Um, it, it's very complicated. Kevin, as we discussed, there's a variety of issues that make this situation uh, uh, actually very, very complex and frankly very unique in the world of sport. First issue we've got to deal with is due process. We've got to make sure that all the athletes, if they do test positive in a drug test, they have due process rights, they're able to defend themselves, they're able to have a forum in which their arguments can be heard before final adjudication is made. And, and that's complicated uh, because we're dealing with a variety of athletic commissions around the world. Sometimes we're self-regulating. Um, so uh, th that is an issue that we need to, to deal with. The second issue, which is the one I think you alluded to, is sort of the legal and regulatory landscape. Again regulated by numerous athletic commissions and federations around the world. Um, and those federations and athletic commissions have the exclusive jurisdiction to regulate those events. So they are the bodies that regulate uh, the events exclusively, and uh, we have to interact with them to put together a, this process. The other uh, complicating legal factor is that our athletes are independent contractors. They're not our employees. So the parallels to sports organizations like the NFL or Major League Baseball uh, fall apart because we don't have the same legal rights that an employer has over an employee. As you know, our athletes uh, uh, fight for us about two and a half to three times per year. The rest of the year, they're training independently, they're working with nutritionists, they're working with all sorts of people that we have no control over. And that's very, very different than the vast majority of sports organizations around the world. So it's just another issue that we've got to deal with in this complex process. Uh, the third thing is a unique logistical situation we have to deal with. Um, once again, drawing parallels to sports teams, if you're uh, the Denver Broncos, all of your athletes are in Denver during significant parts of the year. Uh, we have athletes that live in 45 different countries around the world, speak different languages. So we've got some significant logistical issues that we have to deal with. All of these things are solvable, uh, but it's just going to take us a little more time to do it. So. In, just to reiterate what Lorenzo said, I don't think anything's changed. I think we're, we're just considering and to, to, to deal with these complicated issues, and I think what happened was obviously there were some high-profile tests that got us to the point where we said, listen, we need to get out and address these issues, and even though we don't have the specific plan with uh, an organization in place right now, we wanted to lay out uh, the specifics that we had and, of course, the direction that we did. A couple other things. Um, most people who run, you know, anti-doping agencies say that when the athlete knows the test is coming, it's the easiest test to be. So even your championship policy, where they're going to, there's going to be enhanced testing, they know that at that particular period of time, I don't know when, but at some point in this period of time, I'm going to be tested. So doesn't it put more of a burden on you guys to randomly test your champions even more thoroughly because, hey, they know that oh, if I'm fighting in September 10th, okay, starting, you know, in August, anytime, you know, or July, anytime forward, I'm going to be tested, so I have to be off the sauce, so to speak. So my question is, don't you have to try to catch those guys maybe before they go into camp when they're just working out in the gym getting ready and they may be using at that point to try to prepare for camp? Well, I think what we laid out is really a multi-step process. We talked about ensuring that we test all main event fighters and all championship bouts, okay? That testing will take place probably anywhere from 12 to 14 weeks leading up to the event, certainly when the, the event or the, the uh, main event and the championship bouts are announced. Because there is a random nature to that and multiple tests, it obviously becomes significantly harder to potentially beat one of those tests. And the data actually shows that, right? Um, if there are ways to beat the test, on, and you know you're going to get tested on the night of the fight, you look, we've got a 1.3, 1.1% failure rate, but when we talk about out of competition, we know it's at least 20-something percent. So we know that we're going to be able to attack it from that standpoint. The other tier is we're going to institute a purely random testing procedure for out of competition. You may have a fight announced. You may not have a fight announced. You may be not training at all, but somebody will show up 
on a random basis and take a sample. These are all things that we're working out now. It's significant from a logistical standpoint, from a cost standpoint, but we are committing to do that on a go-forward basis. What we are now working on is talking to these third-party agencies to try to figure out how many of these tests do we need to do from a sample standpoint to ensure, or at least be pretty sure, that we've got a clean sample. You know, it's enough to make sure that our athletes can be deemed clean from that standpoint. And then my final question, I'll let somebody else talk, but, you know, given the regulatory and the legal issues that exist, if you test somebody out of competition and they fail, who is the penalizing body at that point? Because if the UFC just enacts a random test out of competition, obviously these, you know, and some of the fighters dispute the test and, you know, whatever the case may be, who is the legal entity that is going, is it going to be WADA or VADA or USADA, or who is it that's going to hand down the suspension to that fighter and enforce it? It's going to be, frankly, a variety of groups, including ourselves. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to have to obviously strengthen our individual contracts with our athletes to give us stronger rights to suspend athletes if they test positive. The second thing, which we've discussed a lot about, Kevin, is continuing to work with athletic commissions and federations around the world to convince them to absolutely adopt these suspensions if they're handed down. And that is the key, frankly, still, you know, relatively unresolved legal issue that we've got to figure out. You know, at this point, effective July 1st, if we don't have those issues worked out, we're going to have to take the, you know, proverbial leap of faith that athletic commissions are going to, and federations are going to stand behind these decisions. But in the meantime, we're going to work very, very hard to try to put a legal framework in place that does exactly what you said. Once we hand down a suspension, it's being honored by every athletic commission, every federation globally. Lawrence, to follow up on that, just uh, right here to your left. Uh, results management, I mean, what, what is the, in your mind, in a perfect world, how, how are, are results managed, specifically, obviously, failed tests? Well, if I understand your question uh, correctly, um, we have a third-party organization managing this stuff for, for us. I mean, you know, we are not in the drug testing business. We're in the media, sports media business. We, we don't want to be uh, you know, taking samples and sending them to labs. We need to have a third-party organization doing that. Um, we're going to have to develop protocols, frankly, for what happens when that third-party organization takes a test and that test is is, um, is positive. So uh, we'll have to develop protocols for that, for announcing, uh, in particular, the, the random test. When we're in an, an event where uh, an athletic commission or federation is regulating that particular event, uh, we would continue to work, I believe, with the, the athletic commission or federation as far as announcing the results of any positive test. One from Lorenzo, you, when you mentioned, and this is for Dana as well, when you, when you mentioned you know, getting behind the water standard of a four-year ban, obviously that four-year ban is with the Olympics in mind. With this particular sport, do you have an idea? I mean, is, is four years your best idea, or is that just something that, because obviously you want to support the water code, for your sport, what is appropriate? Do you think? That's a good question. I, I think that what we do know is that the current uh, system or the current uh, penalties that are being put forth, we and again, to the phone audience, it is star one to ask a question. The proof is in the pudding. We're seeing this continually. And when you look at the fact that, you know, these fighters fight anywhere from two to three times per year, if they get a nine-month suspension, in our opinion, they're really only maybe missing one fight. Um, and we just don't think it's enough to deter uh, them. There needs to be harsher penalties, whether it's two years or four years. We're going to have to debate that. We're going to have to look at that. Um, but it certainly needs to be more than what it is today. I agree. And when you look at... The fighters are going to look at the risk versus reward, okay? If I can make, you know, a few million dollars, I'll take the risk of getting caught and getting a nine-month suspension and, and whatever it is. Two or four years is career-threatening. If you're 28 years old and you get busted for a PED and you're off for four years, that might be the end of it. So now you look at the risk versus reward, and it's a lot more dangerous. Uh, Evelyn Rodriguez from uh, Global.com. Uh, just to make it clear, this program will be accumulative to the programs that the commissions already have, like to the anti-drug test that they have out of competition? Yes, it will be in addition to whatever standards the State Athletic Commission's International Federations have in place. Certainly, we're going to push them to increase the number of out-of-competition tests, but as far as testing athletes um, out of competition on a random basis, 
we believe that's something that we're going to have to take on with a third party ourselves, and we're going to have to fund that ourselves. And how's going to work in places like Brazil, where we don't have yet like the out of competition path? Well, we're going to advocate through the current Brazilian Commission that we want them to do out of competition testing for all main events and all championships. In addition to that, we are going to take it upon ourselves to introduce outer competition testing on a random basis for everybody that is on our roster. And uh, I don't know if you guys can comment specific about Anderson Silva's case. Uh, I know he still has to explain himself to the commission and, you know, go through, like, the hearing. But uh, how is the situation with the UFC now? Like, are you guys going to uh, apply any penalty to him? I think right now the process is taking place. He's got his due process rights. Uh, the commission announced yesterday that they will be um, um, announcing when his hearing date will be, um, present their side of the evidence, Anderson will have his opportunity to present his side of the evidence, and they will render a decision. And until that point, um, we're going to sit back and kind of see how that unfolds. At this point, the Nevada State Athletic Commission is a judici judiciary body that will handle that, that situation. No, I mean, we, the only thing I would guess I would, I guess the answer is yes, I do have something to add. Um, the, the only thing I would add is what Lorenzo Dana said previously is regardless of what happens, Anderson Silva has been a great champion and uh, he's been a great representative of the sport. And if, you know, something bad happened here, um, then the Vast Athletic Commission will handle that. Uh, but, uh, you know, he, did, he does have a gr had a great career and uh, we, we need to honor that and stand behind him regardless of what happens with the Athletic Commission. He still has a lot of fights with, uh, in his contract that I was asking, you know. Like, if you guys can comment on that, but like he had a list of 10 fights or something like that. You don't know. We got to see what happens. He's got to go have his hearing. And like uh, Lawrence said, he's, you know, he's got to go through due process. He's got to, there's, there's, there's a long road to go before we start thinking about Anderson's next fight. Thank you. Good morning, guys. Uh, Ron Kruk with Inside MMA. You all have mentioned the, uh, the challenges that are ahead of you to dealing with the athletic commissions, not only here in the United States, but internationally as well. Do you feel that it is possible to get worldwide testing done in a policy that everyone will follow and use moving forward? I think the answer is yes. Uh, we've laid out the logistical, legal, and, uh, and other challenges that we've got. Uh, but uh, I think the, the answer is absolutely yes. And regardless, we've got to give it a shot, and uh, we're going to try to do it. I feel very confident, though, that we, we can pull this together. You know, it, it, there are some models. The Olympic model is a bit of a model out there that we can, we can take a look at. But the reality is, is that in, in almost every country in the world now, there are WADA labs, WADA certified labs. So, for example, in Brazil, uh, got the Olympics coming into Brazil. There are water certified labs there. It should not be that big of a deal to get an athlete to provide a sample to one of those labs to have it properly analyzed. Are there logistical challenges? Absolutely, yes, but I believe they're, they're absolutely uh, solvable. And I would add to that, I mean, honestly, this is nothing new to what this company's achieved since 2001. As I mentioned before, we were, the sport was regulated in one state. And when we said that we were going to partake on this initiative to get regulation in all states in America, provinces in Canada, and all around the world, people looked at us like we were crazy. And it was an uphill battle. It has been an uphill battle. We didn't have all the answers when we started this thing. But through persistence and, and putting the foundation in place, we are now where we are with an international sport with unified rules that everyone, everyone around the world follows. Um, this is just another example of something that we have to attack we have to be offensive about this. We're not shying away from it. Um, we're hitting it head on. And uh, honestly, it's going to probably get worse before it gets better. But we have to put these procedures in place to eventually make it better. It could be a bumpy road, but we're committed to making this happen. And we've been doing the impossible since day one. It was impossible to get regulated by all the – it was impossible to get back on television. It was impossible to get on pay-per-view. It was impossible to get health insurance for fighters. It, it, we've been doing the impossible since 2001. And about eight months ago, a year ago, I told you guys that we were going to do enhanced testing and we were paying for it, and now we're catching people. And I said, if you're using drugs, you're going to get caught. We spent a half a million dollars. Now we're going to spend millions of dollars. If you are using performance-enhancing drugs, you're going to get caught. And just a quick follow-up. Uh, your commentator, Joe Rogan, had said that 
there's a steroid epidemic, not only in MMA, but in the UFC. When you hear your color commentator making those type of comments, what's your reaction, and do you agree with it? Well, I, you know, Joe, Joe is... Uh... Joe exaggerates, and he's a little flamboyant sometimes. Uh, I, uh, I don't know. To, to, to say that there's an epidemic here, there's definitely a problem. Um, you look at it's no different than any other sport. It, when there's money involved, people are going to find a way to, to beat the system and to get that edge, you know. And, uh, you know, I think because of these high-profile tests and, and the percentage on the out-of-competition test, it leads people to assume that that's the case. Well, I'll tell you what, we're about to find out. And like Lorenzo said, this is going to get a lot worse before it gets better. But Just one quick follow-up with that. You said to ESPN last year that you felt that the PED problem in the UFC was cleaned up. So with that said, what happened here within the past year? Well, what happened is we started doing, we, start, we spent a half a million bucks on out-of-competition testing. You know, and, and I think when... When a guy like Anderson Silva gets caught, it definitely sends a message. You know, I, I think that, that that shocked the entire MMA community and sports world. So it definitely, you know, it shocked me. We were pretty blown away by it, and, and now, now we're going we're gonna to dig in. So you mentioned um, this might get worse before it gets better. It, will that have any concurrent effect on the matchmaking process, putting together fights? This past year, you guys lost a ton of fights to injuries. You know, I mean, enhanced testing could take a bunch of main events out, potentially. Are you guys going to have worse. to book backups? It's going to get worse before it gets better. You know, it certainly could. It certainly could. There's no question about it. But I think what we're saying here is we're committed to making sure that uh, we rid the sport of, of PED usage, and so be it. If, if we lose main events, we lose main events. This company's been through a lot over the last 15 years. We'll survive that, too. Joe Silva and Sean Shelby are just going to have to get a little bit more creative. <laughs> and and what was Anderson Silva the turning point here? I mean, I, I think Parav Sahabi can compare him to Lance Armstrong. Well, we've been no. doing it. We, we've been doing it. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I said, no, I mean, we've been working on this, uh, as I mentioned, for at least a couple of years. We've been in conversations with third parties, um, gosh, at least for six or seven months. Uh, we've made a lot of progress. What the Anderson Silva thing has, has prompted us to come out and address these issues make sure that we're speeding up the process. We don't have the, uh, the luxury of kind of sitting back and being uh, uh, academic and, and debating all these legal points. We just got to go. And however the car cards fall, they're going to fall. But we're going to make sure that, that fighters are being tested and uh, the results will be what the results be. And you mentioned third parties. Can you talk about, can you mention any of the names that you're talking to? You thought of that any? There's, there's confidentiality agreements involved in the discussions that we've had. There's not a plethora of these organizations that do that. I think it's pretty self-explanatory. Probably pick about three organizations that exist out there that would be capable of doing this. JT, the Bright Fox Sports Radio. When you talk about out-of-competition testing, I'd like to know if you consulted or talked to other major leaders in other sports leagues. An example would be Major League Baseball in 1998. They had the McGuire Sosa home run chase. Yesterday, the biggest story in sports was Alex Rodriguez's apology. So we're going from 98 to now, to today. What have you learned about time frame and the integrity of the sport when dealing with fans, whereas in baseball, it looked like they failed for well over a decade with their out-of-competition testing? Have you talked to Major League Baseball and consulted with other leaders? We've certainly talked with... Uh drug testing organizations that have worked with those other sports leagues uh, and, and they've you know, sort of conveyed to us the experience that those other sports leagues have gone through. They've also shared with us the successes and the failures and showed us uh, the programs they think have done a better job versus those that have not done as good a, good a job. And that's part of the process that we're going through right now. We are literally... And to our phone audience, again, that is star one to ask a question essentially the best qualities of those programs to develop ours. Very much like what we did with our code of conduct. Went and looked at all the major sports leagues, saw what they were doing, and, and we believe we developed sort of the best in class based upon all the examples that were out there. So, you know, we'll continue to talk with uh, the consultants that we're working at who have experienced those organizations with the goal of, of creating the best protocol of any of the sports organizations globally. And, JT, we're going to move a lot faster than baseball did. They're hitting a the ball with a stick. Who cares?
you have two human beings who go in and compete in combat sports, and if one is is using performance enhancing drugs, it's incredibly dangerous. You know, I, I hate it. I hate everything about it. And uh, if you can't compete in this sport with your natural abilities, you don't belong here. Uh, Chris Matthews, KLAS TV here. Maybe for Lorenzo and Danny here. You guys are jumping out ahead of this thing and, and taking the bull by the horns. And it's probably an obvious answer, but in you guys' opinions, what happens if you just stay status quo and don't do anything? What happens to the sport? And what happens to the UFC? Look, at the end of the day, I think that might be the easy thing to do. Um, but we're in for the long term. This is a, a long term process. I think if we weren't to do anything, I think it would potentially hurt the credibility of the sport in the minds of the consumers. Um, which is the last thing on earth we want to do. Obviously, we, we built this company, we built this brand. We plan on being in business for a long time. And we also, uh, as I mentioned before, have always put health and safety of our athletes first. And this is bought this company in 2001. Um, so not doing anything is not an option. Right, not just us. We've always, I feel like we've, all, we've always been the leader in this industry, in, in, in combat sports, period, in everything that we've done, from health insurance for the fighters to everything that we've done since day one. And, uh, <laughs> you know, I'd like to see a lot of the other combat sports companies start doing this, too, not just us. And there's certainly other combat sports companies out there, MMA companies that have the resources, if not more resources than we have. And boxing. Hello, Heidi Fang for Fox Sports Radio. Uh, I was wondering, ahead of uh, a recent fight card, you guys had decided to withdraw the auto competition testing program. What was particularly the reason for that, and, and what caused the change now? What did you say? Uh, there was a period of time, I think it was right before John Jones fought at UFC 182, where you had stated that you were withdrawing the auto competition testing No, no, program. no. We ne I never said that. That's oh. not what I said. I said... With the things that had gone on, this thing was t a bigger challenge th than, uh, than we had expected it to be. And, you know, the stuff that went down in China. And uh, I, I said, we, we got to regroup and put it. But we still, we spent, spent a half a million dollars in, in, in auto comp or enhanced testing with the athletic commissions. We, we were still doing it. But at that time, we were talking about, you know, uh, how this whole thing was going to work globally. And that's basically what we've been saying up here all day. It's, it, it's tough to get your arms around this thing, um, but we're going to figure it out. Also, what can be done to get these pre-fight drug tests back on a, a quicker turnaround? It seems with some of them, they've been coming back after the fight. What has been done with the commissions? And well, I think there was one that came back after the fight. There were a lot of pre-fight drug tests that were done on guys. Uh, one came back late, and it looked very suspicious, and that's what I cleared up here today. But what can be done on a level between the UFC and commissions to try to make that process expedited, do you think? I'm sure the commissions are addressing that. I'm, you know, I'm sure that that's something that's at the top, at the top of their list. The last thing on earth they want to do is have what happened in the Anderson Silva situation. They're going to do pre-fight testing. They're going to want to have the, the results ahead of it. Thank you. And just to follow up, along those lines, you know, obviously you guys think you have jurisdiction do year-round drug tests your fighters, but you you want that enhanced testing for the main event and for main uh, and for championship fights to be still be done by the athletic commission. Why is that? Because obviously the commissions have have that jurisdiction as well. But why not just take it completely off their hands? Because some of these commissions they do seem like they would not have the knowledge to you know really run that program. Well, first of all, I mean we believe that you know obviously the Nevada State Athletic Commission, California, New Jersey, and other athletic commissions certainly have the ability to do this. Comfortable with that. We also got to be careful that we don't subjugate the, the authority of a commission or a federation by just stepping in and taking over. I mean, we, we just can't do that. So this is kind of a you have to walk a fine line between advocating that they do this, telling them that we will pay for it, we have to administer the process. And outside of that, you know, we're going to have to figure out how to how to pull this together and do all of the out really out of competition testing just on a random basis. And that's that's what. Hopefully in the near future, not hopefully, but in the near future, we will have, uh, the, we will lay that out in detail. The only thing to add there is the other thing that's nice about working through athletic commissions is that the legal protocols are already in place. So if the, if the test comes through the Nevada Athletic Commission, for example, and it's positive, then they have a whole regulatory uh, legal process whereby 
the athlete then can appeal that decision. The final decision is made. Once that final decision is made, it is shared with athletic commissions around the world and is generally honored by athletic commissions around the world. So we, we get ourselves out of that legal issue that, that Kevin uh, and I discussed uh, a moment ago. All right, Dana, Lorenzo. I think Kevin's got one more question. Um, go to Kevin first, and we'll go to the lines. <clears throat> two, two quick ones. Follow up. If a champion tests positive and, and the test is affirmed, will he be stripped or will there be an interim champion? I mean, how, do you, how will you deal with that, specifically if a champion of a division tests positive? Well, I mean, our assumption as we laid out kind of what we'd like to see happen today is that if anyone, let alone a champion, tests positive, you know, we're advocating for stricter uh, penalties, which would mean, in our case, hopefully a minimum of two years. If the title is not going to be on the shelf for two years, then yes, uh, the, the athlete would drift. I mean, we certainly got to sit down and work through all of these issues, but we certainly don't want to have, you know, a title sitting on the sidelines for two years. But that's where it leads to my follow-up question, because Nevada is like the first test tends to be uh, first positive tends to be nine months. Other states they have regulations in place that they do, they're not signatories to the WADA code. So if you test positive in Texas, Texas is a commission that one time, quote unquote, forgot to test Julio Cesar Chavez. So, you know, the, the fact is if they give a nine month suspension, you could still just let, let the champion keep his title, right? And so my question is under a case like that where if the co specific commission does not adopt the WADA code and say, we're going to suspend this guy for two years or four years, would you take that additional action to say, okay, we're going to disqualify you and, and remove your title? I think that um, obviously we would we'll address that when and if it ever happens, but we would want to be consistent with what we're sitting here saying today is that we believe that the standards should, should move up to at least a minimum of two years. We'd be very disappointed if, if any athletic commission at least didn't um, Think about that and, and think about the issues and address it. But we'll cross that bridge when and if we ever get there. All right, Dana, Lorenzo, Lawrence, we are going to open up the lines from the conference lines from around the world. First up, we're going to go to Gareth Davies from the London Daily Telegraph. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Just want to commend you for, for this move. Um, two questions, really. First of all, are you seeking to push the commissions to expedite the process between testing and, and, and revelation of the of the tests first of all because obviously that's caused a few issues and secondly what will happen for places like the united kingdom where there are events where the ad hoc commission obviously is based in in las vegas yeah as far as the the testing goes i think the, the key thing is getting the test is test started as early as we possibly can. So Lorenzo mentioned uh, a moment ago that uh, if we begin testing, you know, 10, 12, even more weeks prior to the event, that obviously gives us more time to get the test results back. So that's an important, I think, factor in getting those test results back before the event. Obviously, we're going to have to ask um, through athletic commissions for expedited results. I mean, that's another thing we've got to make sure that we do when performance enhancing drugs uh, tests are done. Those results need to get back before uh, the events. Otherwise, you know, they they're obviously don't have the same effect. Um, when it comes to the self-regulated uh, jurisdictions like the UK, for example, our model has always been to follow the Nevada rules and, and essentially take the model that Nevada has used to regulate events here in the U.S. And I think what we're going to do here in Nevada is advocate to the commission that uh, the penalties for positive drug tests are extended to, uh, you know, two years, for example. And uh, when Nevada adopts those rules, uh, we, will, uh, we will be using essentially those same rules when we self-regulate. Um, and I, I, in speaking with the Nevada Commission, I don't think there's going to be any issues with respect to extending some of the, uh, the penalties. But at the end of the day, we will plan on following Nevada rules when we self-regulate. The good news is, is that the jurisdictions where we self-regulate are becoming fewer and fewer and fewer each year. Athletic commission federations that we are supporting and fostering around the world are filling the space and are doing the work that athletic commissions do here in the United States. So we're hopeful there will be a day, even in the UK, where at some point we have a regulatory body that will be handling all of these issues for us. Thanks very much. I hope this is a seminal day for the sport. Thank you very much. We'll take our next question from Jack Incarnacio with the Boston Herald. Hi, folks. Have you ever had conversations with the Nevada Commission or any commission about whether they would accept failed test results through UFC-administered tests? 
we have had those discussions uh, with a variety of athletic commissions and federations uh, uh, around the world. Uh, discussed uh, that as one of the complicating legal factors that we're going to have to address. In some situations, there may be statutory or regulatory uh, regulation changes that will need to take place in those states so these decisions can be honored. Uh, Lorenzo said we've, we've, uh, we've dealt with, and Dana said it also, we've dealt with challenges in the past and people told us we couldn't do things. Uh, the bottom line is we were able to get athletic commissions and federations around the world to regulate the sport. And I feel confident, it may take some time, that we will get athletic commissions and federations to honor the random out-of-competition tests that we do and any suspensions that result from positive tests. What did Nevada in particular tell you guys when you asked them if they would accept the test results? Yeah, I mean, you have to ask Nevada about that, but the, the, the discussion we have with Nevada and other commissions was exactly what I said. There are some legal challenge issues and regulations that may need to be updated before uh, automatically positive results and suspensions that we issue would be honored, but uh, those are all issues that I, I feel confident over time we'll be able to figure out. The Kung Lee situation, of course, took place in China with a Hong Kong lab, and it was one of the things that was cited for kind of a change in posture from you guys on administering these tests on your own. Uh, everything you've outlined today, just sort of, uh, at least in terms of the random tests, adds more responsibility to you guys in every global market. I mean, how can, how can we be confident that these changes aren't going to result in similar uh, mishaps like the Kung Lee situation when you guys try to do this in your self-regulated jurisdictions? Yeah, that's actually not the case. What we've educated here today is that a third-party testing organization handle all of these tests. So in the Kong Lee situation, um, essentially we, we contracted with a lab in China. That's not the model that we're talking about going forward. We're talking about partnering with a leading worldwide anti-doping agency that will handle all of the logistics for taking those tests, getting them to the lab, and uh, of course getting the results done. So uh, what happened in China is absolutely not what we're talking about here today. Will you folks insist that whoever you contract with test for both blood and urine? Yes. I mean, once again, it's going to be a worldwide leader in anti-doping and testing, and they're really the ones that are setting the standard for the science for the testing protocol. So we're really looking for them to, to tell us what needs to be done to ensure that we have a clean sport. And from the conversations that we've had with various entities, that would include both urine and blood so that you could detect, you know, all forms of heat. Of course, you folks have fighters around the globe. We haven't, uh, there have been issues where fighters literally flee at the prospect of an out-of-competition test. How, how will you find all of your fighters to administer uh, random tests in particular? And uh, would you subject them to penalties for running away from testers? You know, I think, I think a lot of this road has been paved by uh, international sports, whether it be uh, you know, FIFA, whether it be the Olympics, whether it be the World Cup, and, and we would just essentially you know, look, look at how they've addressed those issues. I think part of it is a system where the athletes have to check in. They have to let you know where they're going to be essentially at all times. Um, and you know, we would look to this third-party administrator to, to, to set those rules forth, and, and we would adopt those and, and, and stand by them. Now, how would you folks prefer that uh, the subjects of random tests be selected? Uh, people who have had PED issues in the past select the name out of a hat. Um, will we know as a public um, and as media if someone passes a random test? Actually, the way the selection works will, will most likely be done by the third party, and we won't even know who is being tested, when or why. I think we want to be uh, uh, not part of that process. Certainly, we would be informed. Um, when a test comes back. Um, I'm sure they would give us a full accounting or reporting. We haven't worked out, though, yet exactly how the timing of that would work, nor um, you know, when that would be um, announced to the media. But certainly we would. We will be transparent in the process, and everybody will be made aware. And finally, folks, and thanks for taking my questions, are you worried that less PEDs in the sport will, less, will make fights less exciting? I think no. I actually think that uh, that that you know when we went through the whole testosterone era, you know there were guys who could stick around longer. If you can keep these 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 athletes off this garbage in their younger career, I actually think it's going to be a lot better, a lot better. We don't worry about the fights at all. You either have the natural ability to fight or you don't. Thank you. Thank you. 
Our next question comes from Dave Diebert with Post Media News. Hi, you guys. Uh, Dana or Lorenzo, uh, I think you could handle this. Um, have you heard from any sponsors uh, in, in the wake of all of this? And was there any concern raised um, over um, uh, perception, reality, that uh, that there is a uh, drug problem in the sport from the sponsor's perspective? We try to be proactive in, in reaching out to our uh, affiliates, our sponsors, whether it be our media broadcast partners, whether it be sponsors, to kind of hit this head on and let them know what's going on, so there's no surprises. Um, we haven't necessarily had um, a lot of inbound calls with people that have concerns, but the people that do have questions or have concerns, we certainly hit it head on. We answer the questions, but we haven't necessarily seen uh, any drastic uh, reactions or, or fallout for that matter. That's, you know, we, we know that we need to get ahead of this. That's why we're doing this today. All right. And uh, just one other one. That, um, how close in the past were you guys to uh, installing a uh, comprehensive program similar to the one um, announced today, and what prevented it from, uh, from happening when you guys were um, giving it as close a look as you say you were? We've been very close. I mean, we've made a lot of progress. As I mentioned, we've worked on this for the last six to nine months as far as directly engaging with some of these third parties to try to figure out how this could be implemented, how it would work, what the cost of it would be. I think that, uh, as we mentioned, there, there are a number of legal issues, um, regulatory issues that surround this. Certainly not easy. It is very complicated. And, um, you know, that is what prevented us from kind of, you know, setting exact dates and jumping into it. But as we mentioned before, we feel like we have enough information now. Uh, we feel comfortable with the issues and that they can be resolved, and that's why we're comfortable sitting up here. And like we said, quite honestly, the fact that we had these high-profile cases come out in a matter of the last month, we felt like it was important that we just had to kind of jump in head first, uh, make the commitment, um, address the issues, and, and here we sit today. Um, so it, uh, nothing to do with uh, with the potential cost. You you've mentioned a couple times the number five hundred thousand tenfold in terms of of cost. You know the amount of money that such a program will cost you, or potentially losing uh, headliners. Uh, that was never um, that was that was never raised as a possible reason to you know extend the the search for a comprehensive program like this. Well, through the search process, that's how we started to find out all the information. And, of course, those are issues that were hotly debated within the company. I mean, I think any company would, would look at that. Um, but we made the decision that, that that's not the overriding factor. The overriding factor, number one goal, is to make sure that we have a clean sport, no matter what it costs, no matter what the uh, consequences are with the fight falling down. And that's why we're here today. We're, we're, we're telling the world, we're telling the media, we're telling our our fans that we're willing to, to move forward under any circumstances, whatever it may be. We encourage other uh, companies, other members that, that are involved in our sport to adopt the same policies and procedures, and that, that's the direction we're going. We've led this industry to day one, and this is we're going to continue to lead um, as we move forward here. All right, thanks, guys. And we only have time for one or two more questions. We'll take our next question from Ariel Helwani with MMAfighting.com. Hey, guys. Just wanted to ask a couple of quick follow-ups. You said that this, uh, the, the entire drug testing program will go into effect July 1st, but let's say those two title fights on July 11th. Would that start earlier for those? Because you said you know, there will be random testing for um, championship fights. Would those fighters, those four fighters, actually have to, you know, undergo this, say, you know, May, June, et cetera? Yeah, I mean, this, once again, this isn't something new. They're, they're, we're sitting here today because there has been out-of-competition testing over the last couple of years. We've identified that there's a problem. Because we've identified a problem, we believe that the number of tests need to be expanded, okay? Um, the Nevada Athletic Commission has certainly taken the lead They've been the most progressive regulatory agency in trying to address this problem. That July 11th fight will be at the MGM Grand. It will be a double title fight, and I fully expect that, and the Nevada Athletic Commission can speak for themselves, but I fully expect for them to continue um, in their protocol as far as testing whatever they want to test. We fully back them. We expect that they will test the two championship bouts. They may test additional fights on the card, out of competition, 
I don't care if they, they test every fight on the card out of competition. That certainly is, they're capable of doing it. I'm sure they will address that, and you guys can, can ask them that, those questions uh, as need be. Do you have any idea when you will announce which third-party drug testing firm you will be uh, partnering with? We don't have a specific date, but obviously we kind of set a drop-dead date to get this program going uh, by July 1st, so it certainly will be uh, in advance of that. Can you tell us which you've talked to? I mean, there's obviously a, like a, just a handful of very big, reputable names. Can you confirm any of those names? Once again, as I mentioned, we've had these conversations. We've signed confidentiality agreements. We've asked not to disclose, you know, who we talked to, what the conversations were. But like I mentioned before, there's not a ton of these uh, institutions or a ton of these companies um, that really do this on a worldwide scale. And I'm sure you can connect the dots and figure out who we've talked to. Okay, and then two last quick ones. You know, prior to the Reebok deal, you said that um, you called some of the fighters to let them know about this. I was just wondering if you called any of you know your top fighters to let them know about this new um, policy and what kind of reaction you got from any of them if you did. Well, certainly, you know, when we when we called the press conference, um, I assume you know our, our fighters knew that, that something was happening. And every conversation myself and Dana have had with individual fighters as we meet with them just on an ongoing basis, we reiterate that. Uh, there will be uh, enhanced drug testing going forward, that policies and procedures will, will increase, will continue. And, uh, you know, we've gotten a positive response from everybody. I mean, um, I got some uh, messages last night from some of the fighters on our current roster, essentially, you know, saying, this is a great day. We're, we're excited for this. We're happy that you guys are doing this. And, uh, you know, basically bring it on. You know, we're, we're clean athletes. and. I had a conversation yesterday or the day before Chris Weidman. He obviously has been tested out of competition a number of times. He's always come back clean. He has uh, said the same thing. He's very excited about it. But quite honestly, we've been working fast and furious here and over the last uh, week uh, to pull all of this stuff together. And, and quite honestly, I would like to have called all five, 585 fighters on the roster, but just wasn't, wasn't feasible. Robbie Lawler, too. Robbie Lawler, when George St. Pierre made some comments, said, Let's do it. I'll go through all the testing you want to go through. Come on back and fight me. So I think I think a majority of the guys, nobody said anything negative about it, that's for sure. Look, and, and there was a question asked earlier, do we think that it will take away from the fights if these guys aren't using PEDs? I mean, kind of silly. I mean, you look at some of the most exciting fighters on the roster have gone through um, out of competition testing and passed for PEDs, whether it be Weidman, um, Robbie Lawler, a number of guys, you know, they, they've been through the process. It's very strict. It's very rigorous. It's both urine, it's blood. They test for EPO, uh, HGH, um, all kind of banned substances. And, and so far, they've come back clean. We're going to continue to add to that and enhance all these programs and add to these programs. We think it's the best thing for the sport. And I think that's another testament to the money that we've spent. We've caught guys on EPO. We've caught guys on these, these, these different types of drugs that are hard to test for. Okay, and then, and then lastly, and I apologize if you may have mentioned this earlier, but do you have any idea, how, like let's say from January 1st to December 31st, not you know this year, which will be starting in, in July, how much all of this will cost? Because I suspect when you say that a lot of the commissions might need the financial help that you're willing to do so, I suspect most of them will need that financial help in addition to the random testing of the 585 fighters. So do you have any idea, have you, have you put aside a certain number as to how much this will actually cost? Unfortunately, even in talking to some of these third parties, they, they, they can't give us an exact number, an exact budget, because there are many variables that, that go into this. Uh, obviously, the number of fighters tested, where the fighters are located. If a test comes back positive, there's got to be a judiciary process, which is going to add to the cost. Just too many variables. So we just have ranges. What we do know is it's going to be millions of dollars. Um, I would say after the first year or two years, we'll have a bit of a history. We'll be able to kind of budget for these things a little bit better, but we're kind of flying blind here a bit and just saying that whatever it is, it is, and we're just going to move on and, and deal with it. You are prepared to pay it all? Unless you want to kick in. Huh? <laughs> uh, I'll get back to you on that. <laughs> Thanks. Our final question comes from Damon Martin with Spo uh, sorry, Fox Sports. Hey guys, uh, real quick, and this may sound like an obvious question, but uh, we know the suspensions you talk about, you know, enforcing stiffer penalties, but obviously that does still come down to the commissions. They may not want to do, you know, a two-year suspension or whatever it is. So my question kind of goes back to the Reebok deal. 
Uh, you said when this uh, new plan gets implemented in July, you know, fighter rankings will drive fighter pay for the Reebok deal. Is there any thought in terms of penalties with that, you know, a fighter being removed from the rankings if they test positive? Because obviously, in a case of like a Hector Lombard, he sits at number five, the guy right behind him, you know, maybe he gets a bump in pay or a significant bump in pay if he's now number five. So is any of that, maybe that's a little bit more deeper than you thought, but is that something you guys have addressed? I think it's the same, it's, it's the same answer to the question that Kevin asked about a champion. I, 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 and Lorenzo said earlier, and Lawrence said, we think that a lot of the athletic commissions will, will go with this. Uh, it, you know, this all, isn't all going to happen overnight. It's going to be, it's, it's all a work in progress. But, uh, uh, yeah, the answer is yes. Yeah, we, I don't think we've ever had a conversation with any regulatory body that said, you know, that, that they don't agree that the sport needs to rid itself of EDs. And I don't think we've ever talked to any uh, regulator that, that hasn't been in favor of looking at the, uh, the penalties and trying to see if there's a way to increase the penalties so that, um, you know, it'll be a bigger deterrent for, for athletes to uh, engage in this activity. So, look, I mean, is it, is it theoretically possible that an athletic commission or, or an international federation may not want to increase the penalties? Theoretically, it's possible. Do I think in actuality that that will happen? I don't. I think that that um, the regulatory bodies will, will look at this and will hopefully will take our input and uh, will increase and have stricter penalties all the way around. That's, that's our hope. Thank you. All right. Thanks for coming today. Thank we you. appreciate it very much.